Good morning, everybody. We are starting today with Srimad Bhagavata Mahapurana, Book 10, Discourse 59, which is entitled, The Lord Snatches Away a Parijata Tree and Kills the Demon Naraka. Um, so at the very end of the preceding discourse, uh, Sri Shuka mentioned that um, Krishna, the, uh, he, so he had just gone through the eight primary wives called the Ashtabharya of Krishna, but mentioned that there were thousands more rescued from the captivity of Bhomasura um, after killing him. So the Raja Parikshit submitted, Please recount the aforesaid exploit of Sri Krishna, the wielder of the Sharanga bow. How the demon Naraka, who Parikshit knows is another name of Bhaumasura, was made short work of by the Lord, and wherefore the aforementioned damsels were kept in bondage. Sri Shuka replied Having been apprised of the nefarious activities of the demon Naraka, son of Mother Earth by Indra, whose umbrella, one of the insignia of sovereignty had been snatched away by the demon, whose mother Aditi had been robbed of her earrings by the demon and who had been evicted from Mani Parvata Peak on Mount Mandara, where she had formerly lived. The Lord rode on Garuda, the king of birds, along with his spouse Satyabhama, who he took with him on this adventure, and flew to Prag Jyoti Shapura, the capital of the demon Naraka um, and the premier town of the Asura kingdom of Prag Jyotisha, which is said to be located in um, the modern Indian state of Assam. Fortified on all sides with ramparts of mountains and weapons such as artillery, rendered difficult of access due to its belts of water, fire, and wind and encircled with myriads of dreadful and strong snares laid here and there by the demon Mura, an associate and follower of Naraka. Sri Krishna, the wielder of a mace. Um, oh, and there's a footnote here that I think is worth mentioning. So when we, when Shuka says that um, Indra came and alerted Sri Krishna of the offenses of this demon, including stealing his umbrella. Um, it was, technically wasn't his umbrella, it was his, the um, umbrella of his brother Varuna, the guardian of the Western Quarter and the god of water. Um, but since Indra is the head and overlord of all the Lokapalas and the ruler of the three worlds, he considers this an encroachment on his own sovereign rights. And so sort of in a kingly way, calls it his umbrella because he considers everything that belongs to his brothers to be his. Um, furthermore, in other scriptures, such as the Harivansha and the Vishnu Purana, it explains in a little bit more detail why Krishna took his wife Satyabhama with him into battle on this occasion, uh, mainly because she insisted on coming. Satyabhama was kind of more um, fierce and adventurous than most of Krishna's other wives and liked to accompany him on adventures, even into battle sometimes. But also specifically in this case, Satyabhama was especially an incarnation of Mother Earth. And since Narakasura is a direct child of Bhumi Devi, of Mother Earth, Krishna is essentially um, killing Satyabhama's own son on this, on this expedition. And so essentially to have her blessing and her permission and because she wanted to be there for it. He's, that, um, that's why she, he's bringing her along. Sri Krishna, the wielder of a mace, shattered down the ramparts of mountains with his mace, Kal Modaki, the fortifications of weapons with his shafts, the belts of fire, water, and wind with his chakra sudarshana, and the snares laid by Mura with his sword. He blew down the engines fixed on the ramparts and broke down the hearts of the gallant defenders with the blasts of his famous conch, Pancha Janya, and the fortification wall with his massive mace. Hearing the blast of Pancha Janya, 
terrific as the clap of thunder at the end of a kalpa. The five-headed demon Mura rose from under the water of the moat where he had been lying asleep. Lifting up his trident, that terrible demon, who shone like the sun and fire appearing at the end of a kalpa and was difficult to gaze at, darted at the Lord, even as a serpent would rush at Garuda, devouring, as it were, the three worlds with his five gaping mouths. Brandishing his trident and hurling it with force at Garuda, the demon roared with all his five mouths. Filling the horizon and the atmosphere, as well as all the four quarters, the great roar, the great roar covered the entire cosmos. By a pair of shafts discharged with great vigor, Sri Krishna split into three the trident, even as it came flying at Garuda, and struck in return the demon's wide open mouths with more shafts. Mura hurled his mace in indignation at Sri Krishna. With his own mace, Sri Krishna um, split into thousands, the splinter, uh, thousands of splinters the said mace as it came flying over the battlefield. And um, Shukadeva here poetically calls Sri Krishna the elder brother of Gada, um, Gada being a nickname of um, one of Krishna's relatives. And Gada also means mace. And so to call him the elder brother of mace is a way of also asserting his superiority over Mura's mace weapon. It's essentially a pun that works in Sanskrit. The invincible Lord lopped off in mere sport with his chakra, all the five heads of the demon, as he rushed at him, lifting up his arms. With his head severed, the demon Mura fell lifeless into the water, like a mountain whose crest had been sundered by the might of Indra. His seven sons, distressed as they were at the death of their father and impatient to take vengeance, stood fully prepared to give battle. Urged on to an encounter by the demon Naraka, the son of Mother Earth, and placing Pita, their generalissimo at their head, Tamra, Antariksha, Sravana, Vibhavasu, Vasu, Nabhasvan, and Aruna the seventh, sallied forth equipped with arms. Coming up fierce through rage, they hurled shafts, swords, maces, javelins, spears, and pikes at the invincible Lord. Lord Sri Krishna of unfailing prowess, so the tradition goes, cut down with his own shafts, the body of arms into pieces as small as the sesame seed. The Lord sent them all, Pita and the others, to the abode of death. Their heads, thighs, arms, feet, and armors having been lopped off or split open. Enraged to see from the top of the fortress the generals of his army having been killed by the Chakra Sudarshana and the arrows of Sri Krishna, the immortal Lord, the demon Naraka son of Mother Earth, rushed forth with an army of sea-born elephants. Perceiving Sri Krishna with his spouse Satyabhama mounted together on Garuda like a cloud united with lightning and appearing above the sun, Naraka hurled at him the javelin known by the name of Shatagni, uh, which literally just means um, hundred fires, a supernatural weapon. All his warriors too hit him all at once. With his sharp arrows endowed with peculiar wings, Lord Sri Krishna, again we call him the elder brother of Gada, forthwith hit the troops of Naraka in such a way as to lop off their arms, thighs, and necks, and mangle their bodies and kill their horses and elephants. Born by Garuda, who was striking down elephants with his wings, Sri Krishna with his sharp arrows, three for one, <clears throat> cut down a few minutes later, a jewel among the Kurus, all the weapons and missiles that were employed by the hostile warriors against him. Being struck by Garuda with his bill, wings, and claws, the elephants of the enemy in their distress retreated into their city itself. Seeing his army put to flight when assailed by Garuda, the demon Naraka fought on alone. That son of Mother Earth hit Garuda with the same javelin by which the very thunderbolt of Indra had been beaten off. Though pierced by it, Garuda did not budge any more than an elephant would when struck with a garland. His attempt having proved futile, Naraka, son of Mother Earth, picked up a pike with intent to strike at Sri Krishna. Before he could discharge it, Sri Krishna, with his Sudarshana chakra, which was keen-edged as a razor, lopped off the head of Naraka, who rode on an elephant. Fallen on the ground, 
Naraka's head, which was accompanied with a pair of earrings and adorned with a lovely diadem, shone most resplendent. Oh, what a pity, cried his people, and bravo, exclaimed the rishis, while the chief of devas extolled Sri Krishna, the bestower of liberation, covering him with a shower of flowers. Yeah, welcome back, Radhaji. It has been a while. Glad you could make it. We're in the, um, the battle of um, Krishna and Narakasura. Approaching Sri Krishna, the goddess Earth, Bhumi Devi, the mother of Naraka, delivered to him a pair of earrings belonging to Aditi, mother of the devas, brilliant with jewels chased in purest gold, along with a garland of silver and flowers accompanied by a vajayanti, which is a garland of valuable flowers interspersed with jewels, as well as the umbrella belonging to Varuna, the god of water and the guardian of the Western quarter, and the crest of Mount Mandara, known by the name of Mahamani or Mani Parvata, so-called because of its abounding and precious gems. These are um, other names of the mountain. Bending low in humility with joined palms and with a mind full of devotion, the goddess then glorified Sri Krishna, the Lord of the universe, who is worshiped even by the foremost of gods, O King. Bhumi prayed, Hail to you, O ruler of the very gods of God, O wielder of a conch, discus, and mace. O inner controller of the gods and other beings, my salutations be to you, who have assumed this form in deference to the wishes of your devotees. Um, which is a, particularly an expression of thanks because it was largely in deference to her who, who explicitly prayed for him to assume this form to relieve her burden in the form of the great forces of darkness who had accumulated on her at the time. Hail to you who have a lotus sprung from your navel. Hail to you who are adorned with a garland of lotuses. Hail to you the lotus-eyed one. Hail to you who are possessed of lotus-like feet. Salutations to you who are no other than Lord Vishnu, though appearing as a son of Vasudeva, Vasudeva the human. Salutations to you who are anterior to all evolutes, the cause of Prakriti, the embodiment of perfect knowledge. Hail to you the birthless creator of this universe, the absolute, possessed of endless potencies. Salutation be to you, O inner controller of the great and the small, O Lord, who are one with the five elements, O Supreme Spirit. Again, there's extra significance in her calling him one with the five elements because she herself is one of the five elements. When inclined to create, O Lord, it is you who assume vehement rajoguna, for the dissolution of the universe, you assume gross tamoguna. And for the continuance of the world, you assume abundant sattvaguna, though remaining unobscured, O Lord of the universe. You are the time spirit, primordial matter and spirit, and distinct from them. Myself, water, fire, air, ether, the object, she just lists herself since she is the earth element, the objects of the senses, the gods, the mind, the indriyas, the ego, the mahatattva, the entire mobile in the mobile creation. All this, O oh Lord, is a phantom appearing in you who are one without a second. This son, Bhagadatta, son of Naraka, afraid as he is, has been brought by me to the soles of your lotus feet, O reliever of the distress of those fallen at your feet. Therefore protect him and place on his head your lotus palm, which destroys all sin. Sri Shuka continued, Entreated in these words by goddess Bhumi, bent low with devotion, and vouchsafing security to Naraka's son, Sri Krishna entered the palace of Naraka, son of Mother Earth, full of all kinds of riches. Therein Sri Krishna saw 16,000 Kshatriya maidens snatched away by Naraka, from the gymnasiums of kings as well as of gods, siddhas, and demons after showing valor. And a footnote here um, mentions that though the Bhagavatam rounds the number to 16,000, the number is in fact 16,100 um, abducted women, um, according to the Vishnu Purana, um, and even later in the Bhagavata Purana. 
it just here rounds the number because um, the author was trying to make the verse fit the metrical line. Fascinated to behold that hero among men who had entered the women's apartments, the damsels mentally chose him for their beloved spouse, ushered into their lives by a benign providence. They all severally set their heart on Sri Krishna with the feeling, may he be my husband and may providence approve of this. Sri Krishna sent them all in palanquins to Dwaraka, now that they had been duly washed and neatly dressed, and also sent valuable treasures, chariots, horses, and abundant wealth, as well as 64 swift-footed white elephants descended from Airavata and endowed with four tusks. Flying then to the abode of Indra, the ruler of the Devas, the Lord made over to Aditi, Indra's mother, her pair of earrings, recovered from the possession of Naraka, by whom they had been snatched away by force. So we were just told that Aditi had been recently living on the peak of Mount Mandara, but had been driven away from there by Naraka Sura, so evidently she moved in with her son and is still currently living there. Um, and he also returned the umbrella of Varuna to Indra, who presumably will give it back to his brother Varuna, and was worshipped in return along with his beloved spouse Satyabhama, who is still with him on all these adventures, by the said king of immortals, accompanied by his consort, Shachi Devi. Urged on by his consort, he pulled up a, uh, this is significant, he pulled up a Paridata tree from the garden of Indra, since Satyabhama insisted on taking it, and placing it on the back of Garuda and vanquishing the devas, Indra and all who opposed him stealing their tree, he brought it down to his own capital of Dwaraka. It was planted to adorn the pleasure garden attached to Satyabhama's mansion. Hankering after its delicious fragrance and honey, bees followed it all the way from heaven, Bowing low with reverence and touching his feet with the corners of his diadem, Indra had formerly sought from Sri Krishna, the immortal Lord, the accomplishment of his purpose, the recovery of his mother's earrings and the umbrella of Varuna from Naraka. Once, however, he had his purpose accomplished, he fought with him, though wise, to, uh, to oppose the stealing of the tree. Oh, the ignorance even of the gods who are predominantly sattvika and character, accursed is opulence. Assuming as many semblances as the brides and remaining undiminished, the Almighty Lord espoused with due ceremony those damsels in different mansions at one and the same hour. So he had 16,100 weddings at once, um, appearing in as many bodies. Remaining constantly and simultaneously present in their mansions, which were not only unsurpassed, but were beyond all comparison, Sri Krishna, who wrought inconceivable things and was perfect in his own blissfulness, sported with those part manifestations of the goddess Rama that all of his wives were part manifestations of Lakshmi. Like an ordinary mortal, performing the duties of a householder. Having thus secured for their husband, the spouse of Rama, whose ways even Brahma, the creator and others are unable to make out. The aforesaid ladies waited upon him with incessantly increasing joy, greeting him with glances accompanied by loving smiles in their ever fresh meeting with the Lord, marked by exchange of jokes and bashfulness. Though attended by hundreds of servant maids, they rendered service to the Almighty Lord by going forth to meet him when he called at their door, offering him a seat in excellent articles of worship, laving his feet, meaning um, like massaging them with oil, presenting beetle leaves seasoned with katachu, lime, areca nut, parings, cloves, and cardamom seeds, etc., relieving his fatigue by kneading his feet, etc., fanning him, daubing him with sandal paste, and decking him with garlands in the hot weather, dressing his, uh, dressing his hair, arranging his bed, bathing him, and serving him with refreshments, etc. Thus ends the 59th discourse, entitled, the Lord snatches away a Parijata tree from Indra's paradise and makes short work of Naraka. In the latter half of book 10 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita. Discourse 60, 
is a dialogue between Sri Krishna and Rukmini. Sri Shuka began again. On a certain night, Rukmini, the daughter of King Bhishmaka, accompanied by her female companions, was serving with a fan, her divine spouse, Lord Sri Krishna, the father and illuminator of the world, who was comfortably seated on her own bed. The same birthless Lord who creates, sustains, and destroys the universe by way of sport was born in the race of Yadu for maintaining the standards set up by himself. Rukmini waited upon her spouse, the suzerain Lord of the Worlds, who was comfortably seated on a superb cushion, white as the foam of milk, mounted on a couch, O King, within that inner apartment of Rukmini's palace, whose beauty was heightened by a canopy fringed with brilliant pearl strings hanging from it, by gems serving as lights, by flowers and garlands of jasmines resonant with the humming of black bees, and by silvery rays of the moon that had penetrated into the apartment through eye holes of latticed windows, which was fanned by breezes blowing through the adjoining garden and laden with the fragrance of parijata trees and scented with fumes rising from burning aloe wood and escaping through the aforementioned eye holes filtering out through, um, through the lattice window. Taking from the hand of a female companion, the chowry provided with a handle of jewels, the chowry is the, um, the yak tail fan, the glorious lady rendered service to the Lord, fanning him with it. Holding the handle of the fan in her hand, adorned with rings and bangles, and making music by her anklets made of gems beside the infallible Lord, she looked most charming with the splendor of her pearl necklace, reddened by the saffron painted on her breasts covered by the end of her sari, and with her girdle of unsurpassed value worn about her hips. Delighted to see her, the beautiful Lakshmi herself, since she is indeed an avatar of Lakshmi, who was exclusively devoted to him and had assumed a form matching with Sri Krishna's in beauty, who had sportfully taken a human semblance, on whose countenance, embellished with locks, earrings, and a neck adorned with a gold necklace, shone in nectarine smile, Sri Krishna, who captivates the heart of all, spoke smilingly. The glorious Lord said, Princess, you were sought after by kings who vied in wealth with the, Lord of, with the lords of the spheres, wielded great influence, were endowed with splendor and distinguished for their comeliness, magnanimity, and bodily strength. Leaving them all, the king of Chedi, etc., who were all love intoxicated and have called at your door as suitors, and to whom you had been affianced uh, uh, by your brother and father. How did you choose for your husband us who were no match for you? Using poetically the royal we. Afraid of kings, O beautiful one, ourselves have sought refuge in the ocean, having entered into enmity with the strong, and have well nigh relinquished the royal throne. Since indeed he, he has officially relinquished the royal throne, Ugrasena is still king of Dwaraka, even though in practice Krishna rules, Ugrasena just asks Krishna what to do. O oh, lovely one, generally those women suffer, who follow the track of men whose ways are not clear and who are treading the paths unrecognized by the world. We are penniless and are ever loved by the poor. Therefore, O lady of slender waist, the well-to-do, as a matter of fact, do not generally resort to me. Marriage and friendship should be contracted between those two who are equal to each other in wealth, birth, sovereignty, exterior and future prospects, and never between a superior and an inferior. O princess of Vidarbha, ignoring these facts due to your short-sightedness, you selected us who, though praised for nothing by beggars, are devoid of merits. Even now you choose an eminent kshatriya who is a match for you. Even now choose you an eminent kshatriya who is a match for you. Through him shall you find the desires of your heart fulfilled both here and hereafter. Kings like Shishupala, the ruler of Chedi, Shalva, Darasantha, and Dantavaktra. Nay, your own elder brother Rukmi too bear enmity towards me, O handsome lady. It was in order to curb the pride of those haughty kings who had grown blind under the intoxication of their might that you were brought by me, the eclipser of the wicked, O auspicious one. Having no desire of women, progeny, and wealth, we are really indifferent, remain steeped in a sense of fullness through self-realization, are unattached to home or the body, and doing no work, remain as a witness only like a light. Sri Shuka resumed. Having spoken this much to Rukmini, 
who looked upon herself by virtue of her constant presence by his side as his most beloved wife, the Lord who sought to uproot her pride, thinking that she is his most favored wife of all his 16,108 wives, became silent. Hearing then these unwelcome words, such as had been never heard before, of her beloved husband, the Lord of the Three Worlds, the glorious lady was struck with terror, and shuddering at heart and shedding tears, she was actually plunged into endless grief. With her speech choked with excessive anguish, she stood, scratching the ground with her tender feet gleaming red due to its ruddy nails. Soaking both the breasts painted with saffron by her tears, rendered black through collyrian, and with her and with her face cast down. Severe agony, fear, and grief had so obliterated her reason that the fan dropped from her hand, which allowed the bracelets to slip off as well. The body, too, of that lady, who had lost control over her mind, swooning suddenly, fell down with disheveled hair like a banana tree uprooted by the wind. Seeing his beloved spouse, who had failed to grasp the deep subtlety of his humor, bound to him with such a tie of affection, that merciful and glorious Lord Sri Krishna was moved with pity. Quickly stepping down from the couch and lifting her up, the four-armed Lord, evidently taking on his more divine form, gathered up her locks and wiped her face with his lotus hand. Wiping her tearful eyes and breasts soiled with tears of grief and folding in his arms the virtuous lady, who was single-heartedly attached to him, O king, the Lord, who is the resort of the righteous and knew how to console, comforted his distressed consort who was confounded in mind by the severity of the joke and was undeserving of it. The glorious Lord said, O daughter of the king of Vidarbha, no, do not be angry with me. I know you are devoted to me. I behaved jestingly with you, O beautiful lady, only with intent to hear your retort and to behold your countenance with the lips quivering due to resentment through love, with the corners of the eyes growing red while darting glances, and with the beautiful line of eyebrows knit together in anger. O lady marked with fear and frown to the householders engrossed in their household duties, this indeed is the greatest gain that they pass a few hours and pastimes in the company of their beloved. Trishuka went on. Rukmini, the daughter of the king of Vidarbha, O king, on being thus amply comforted by the Lord, realized his earlier utterances to be a joke and gave up the fear of being abandoned by her darling. Gazing on the Lord's face with affectionate glances graced by a bashful smile, she spoke to that greatest among men, O scion of Bharata. Rukmini said, Of course it is as you said, O lotus-eyed lord, that I am surely unlike you, the glorious one possessed of infinite qualities. What comparison is there between you, the glorious lord of the three principal deities, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, and established in your own greatness, and myself, the primordial nature comprised of the three gunas, and one whose feet are clutched by the ignorant? True it is that you sleep in the ocean of the heart, as if afraid of the three gunas, O Lord of wide strides, who are pure consciousness, the self. You are ever at loggerheads with the wicked senses, and even your servants kick aside such a dark and gloomy thing as, king, as kingship, compared to the bliss of devotion. The ways of sages fond of the honey of your lotus feet are obscure, and hence surely incomprehensible by beasts among men. For when the doings of those who follow you are as those supernatural, those of the Almighty Lord in you yourself must be much more so. Certainly you to whom Brahma and others, who accept offerings from others, bear offerings to you, are akinchana, because there is nothing other than you. Uh, so he called himself akinchana in the sense of I own nothing. But she is saying you are akinchana in the sense that there is nothing other than you. Those blinded by wealth and gratifying their senses do not know you who steal away the hours of their life in the sense of being the, um, the kala, the time spirit. You are the most beloved of those Brahma and others and vice versa. Indeed, you are the embodiment of every object of human pursuit, a personification of absolute joy, seeking which the wise give up everything. Their contact with you is most deserved, but not so of the man and woman who are attached one to the other and subject to pleasure and pain. You have been elected by me as my husband, knowing that your glory has been sung by sages who have renounced the rod and that you are the soul of the universe and are ready to bestow your very self on your, on your devotees. 
and rejecting even Brahma the lotus born and the rulers of heaven, whose fortune and blessings are dashed to the ground by the force of time and propelled by a mere play of your eyebrows. Others, Shishupala and so on, being of no account. Your plea that you resorted to the sea out of fear of the kings has no meaning, O elder brother of Gada, for by the mere twang of the Sharanga bow, you put them to flight and carried away myself, your share, O Lord, as a lion drives away other animals and appropriates its prey. The foremost of kings like Anga, Prithu the son of Vena, Bharata born of Jayanti, the spouse of Lord Vrishabhadeva, Yayati the son of Mahusha, Gaya and others, she's naming famous kings of ages past, <clears throat> retired to the forest, renouncing their undisputed sovereignty in quest of you, O Lord of Lotus Eyes. Did they suffer because they sought your feet here? O Lord, the abode of virtues, the fragrance of your lotus feet grants freedom from transmigration to the people, is the resort of Lakshmi, and has been extolled by men of wisdom. What mortal woman with a clear insight into the real purpose of life, who has once smelt it, would dare ignore it and seek another who was ever subject to grave fears? I have sought as my befitting partner you who are the suzerain lord of the universe, my own self, and the grantor of desired boons both here as well as hereafter. May your feet, which seek him who worships you and release him from the deceptive cycle of births and deaths, prove to be an asylum to me who have been wandering through births. O infallible one, O destroyer of foes, let the king Shishupala and the others suggested by you be the choice of that woman into whose ears has not entered a lay pertaining to you and sung in the courts of Shiva and Brahma. Within their homes, those kings behave towards the ladies like a donkey, an ox, a dog, a cat, and a slave. This human body, the interior of which contains flesh, bones, blood, worms, excreta, phlegm, bile, and wind, is covered with skin, mustaches, nail, and hair on the body and head, is a living corpse. That stupid woman alone serves such a body as a husband who has never enjoyed the fragrance of honey and the lotus at your feet. I wish to burn with love for your feet, O lotus-eyed one, who delight in your own self and do not see anything extraordinary in me. When for the advancement of this world you cast your glance on me, assuming a superabundance of rajas, that alone constitutes, as a matter of fact, supreme grace on me. O Madhusudana, I do not regard your words as without meaning. For some, uh, when you asked me to choose another partner, even now. For sometimes, surely enough, there are girls who, like Amba, cherish love for somebody else. The mind of a woman of easy virtue, though married, is always attracted towards a new person. A wise man should not therefore maintain such an unchaste woman, for by doing so he falls both here and hereafter. The glorious Lord replied, O oh, virtuous lady, it was, in, it was with intent to hear you speak in this strain, O oh, princess, that you were subject to a joke by me. In fact, the interpretation you have put on my words is wholly and literally true. Whatever blessings you seek from me are undoubtedly ever possessed by you, who are solely devoted to me, O oh, blessed one. And blessings sought from me lead to freedom from desires, i.e. liberation. O oh, faultless one, I have come to know your love and fidelity to me. For though I tried to shake you by my words, your mind could not be estranged from me. They who propitiate me, the bestower of liberation, for conjugal pleasures, through austerities and vows, have given their hearts to sensuous enjoyments and are deluded by Maya. Having obtained me, the source and bestower of liberation, as well as of worldly riches, O proud lady, they who seek after the latter only, worldly riches only, and not liberation, are unfortunate, inasmuch as these can be obtained even in the lowest species of life. To such men, however, whose mind is given to the pleasures of sense, even hell appears to be a pleasant resort, that they, they seek after pleasures um, in ways that will lead them into suffering, in other words. Well it is, O mistress of my household, that you have practiced constant devotion to me, which rids one of worldly bondage, and which is very hard to practice for the wicked, and more so for a deceitful woman reeking with unclean desires and given to sense gratification only. In the whole of my household, I do not see a housewife, affectionate like yourself, O proud lady, who, ignoring all the kings assembled on the occasion of your marriage, sent a brahmana carrying a confidential message to me, of whom, of whom you had only heard good accounts, and you had never even personally met. You put up with the disfiguration of your brother vanquished in battle. Nay, his death at the hands of Balarama, 
on the happy occasion of Anirudha's wedding in a tournament of dice playing. Of course, we haven't heard that story yet, but evidently Shukadeva is telling things a little bit out of order. And the grief repeatedly caused by the memory of these unpleasant incidents. You never spoke a word about these things for fear of separation from us. By this conduct of yours, you have completely won me over. A messenger was sent by you with a most judiciously worded message in order to secure my hand. While I was tarrying, you looked upon this world full of relatives and friends as void, and even sought to cast off this body of yours, which you did not consider as worthy of anyone else. Let that unique love of yours stand to your credit. Unable to repay it, we only hail it with joy. Sri Shuka continued. In this way, the almighty Lord of the universe, though immersed in the bliss of self, sported with Lakshmi in the form of Rukmini by indulging in amorous talks with her, imitating the ways of humanity. So did the all-pervading Lord Sri Krishna, the preceptor of the universe, sp um, sporting simultaneously in the mansions of his other spouses too, discharge his household duties like a household. Thus ends the 60th discourse entitled A Dialogue Between Sri Krishna and Rukmini in the latter half of book 10 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanghita. Discourse 61, um, a description of the Lord's progeny and Rukmi killed by Balarama during Anirudha's wedding, um, which evidently occurred before the last discourse since they mentioned it there, but is being told by Shuka after. Sri Shuka began again. The aforesaid wives of Sri Krishna bore him 10 sons each who were in no way in, in, uh, inferior to their father in respect of all their mental and physical qualities. Perceiving Sri Krishna, the immortal Lord, not stirring out of their palaces, but always present there, the princesses regarded themselves each as his most beloved spouse. These ladies were unaware of his real character. The loving ladies were exceedingly charmed by the lovely countenance resembling a lotus flower, long arms, big eyes, glances full of love and merriment and winning talks of the Lord. But with all their charms, they were unable to win the heart of the perfect one. All his 16,000 and odd wives could not shake his mind by their shafts of Kama and other charms skilled in conveying the messages of love dispatched by their arched eyebrows, fascinating with the sentiment expressed by their suppressed smile and sidelong glances. Having gained for their husband the consort of Rama, whose ways even great gods like Brahma are unable to know, the aforesaid ladies indulged with ever-growing delight in loving smiles, affectionate glances, and a longing for union which ever appeared as new, and so on. Though attended by hundreds of servant maids, they rendered personal service to the all-pervading Lord by going forth to meet him when he arrived at their palace, offering him a seat and excellent articles of worship, washing his feet, presenting beetle leaves seasoned with lime, karachu, areca nut, parings, cardamoms, cloves, etc., relieving him of his fatigue by kneading his feet, fanning him, daubing him with sandal paste and adorning him with garlands, tressing his locks, arranging his bed, bathing him, and serving him with dishes of various kinds. Of the wives of Sri Krishna, who had 10 sons each, I mentioned to you the sons, Pradyumna and so on, of the eight principal spouses that have been previously referred to, the Ashtabharya, they're called. With Pradyumna as the eldest, Charudeshna, Sudeshna, the valorous Charudeha, Sucharu, and Charugupta, and next to him, Bhadracharu, as well as Charu Chandra, Vicharu, and Charu as the tenth, were born of Rukmini. They were in no way inferior to their father. Bhanu, Subhanu, Svarbhanu, Prabhanu, and Bhanuman, Chandrabhanu, Brahadbhanu, and Atibhanu, the eighth, as well as Sri Bhanu and Pratibhanu, with the ten sons of Satyabhama. Samba, Sumitra, Purujit, Shatajit, and Sahasrajit, Vijaya and Chitraketu, Vasuman, Dravida, and Kratu. These were the sons of Jambavati, the bear princess. Samba was the eldest of them, and they were all loved by their father. Vira, Chandra, and Ashvasena, Chitragu, Vegavan, Vrsha, Ama, Shanku, Vasu, and the glorious Kunti were the sons of Nagnajiti. Sruta, Kavi, Vrsha, Vira, Subahu, Bhadra, who fought the enemy single-handed, 
Shanti, Darsha, Purnamasa, and Somaka, the youngest, were born of Kalindi, the goddess of the river Yamuna. Praghosha, Gatravan, Singha, Bala, Prabala, Urdhvaga, Mahashakti, Saha, Oja, and Aparajita were the sons of Lakshmana, the daughter of the ruler of Madra. Mitravinda's sons were Vraka, Harsha, Anila, Gridra, Vardhana, Annada, Mahasha, Pavana, Vahni, and Kshudhi. Sangramajit, Brahatsena, Shura, Praharana, Arijit, Jaya, Subhadra, Vama, Ayu, and Satyaka were born of Bhadra, um, who is also called Shaibya. Deeptiman, Tamra, Tapta, and others were the sons of Sri Krishna through Rohini, the first of the other 16,100 wives. And from the loins of Pradyumna, Krishna's firstborn son, appeared the mighty Aniruddha through Rukmavati, the daughter of Rukmi, Rukmini's brother, born while he was living in the city known by the name of Bhojakata, O Parikshit. The mothers of Sri Krishna's progeny numbered 16,000 and odd, Hence, the, grandson, the sons and grandsons of these other sons of Krishna reached the figure of tens of millions, O protector of men. The king Parikshit submitted. How did Rukmi, who had been worsted in battle by Sri Krishna and had ever since been awaiting an opportunity to kill him, give away his daughter to his enemy's son? Tell me this, O learned soul, the circumstances which brought about a mutual alliance through marriage between these two enemies. Yogis clearly see the past, present, and future that which lies beyond the perception of the senses, that which is remote, and that which is intercepted. Sri Shuka replied, Pradyumna, who was Kamadeva incarnate himself, was elected by Rukmavati in a choice marriage. Having completely vanquished in battle, with none other to help him beyond the chariot he drove in, the kings assembled there, he carried her away. Though constantly thinking of his hostility towards Sri Krishna, by whom he had been treated with contumely, yet seeking to oblige his sister Rukmini, who had been instrumental in saving his life, Rukmi gave away his daughter to his sister's son. Kratavarma's son, Bali, O king, married Rukmini's daughter, Charumati, a girl with large eyes, so it is said. Though nursing deep-rooted animosity towards Sri Krishna and knowing such union as contrary to uh, piety, Rukmi gave away his granddaughter, Rochana, to his daughter's son, Aniruddha, with intent to gratify his sister Rukmini, bound as he was by ties of affection with her. For that festive occasion, O king, Rukmini, Balarama, and Sri Krishna, Samba, Pradyumna, and others drove to the city of Bhojakata. The aforesaid wedding being over, some haughty kings with the ruler of Kalinga, uh, which is in modern India called Utkala, at their head, strongly said to Rukmi, thoroughly vanquished Balarama in a game of dice. Ignorant as he is of dice playing, as a matter of fact, O king, great is his addiction to it. Thus advised, Rukmi invited Bala and played at dice with him. In that game, Balarama made a wager of 100, 1,000, and 10,000 gold coins. Rukmi, however, won them all. Showing his teeth on that occasion, the ruler of Kalinga very loudly laughed at Balarama, the wielder of a plow who resented it. Then Rukmi made a bet of one lakh, and Balarama won this time. Resorting to cunningness, Rukmi, however, said, I have won. In other words, Balarama won, but Rukmi is trying to cheat and claim dishonestly that he won somehow. Like the sea on a full moon, Balarama, the glorious one, was now agitated with anger. In other words, like um, his, the tide of his anger was, was raised up. His eyes, which were naturally red, began to glow with rage, and he made a wager of a hundred million gold coins. According to the laws of gambling, Balarama won that too. Taking recourse to deceit, Rukmi, however, said, I have won. Let these umpires arbitrate on this point. A voice from the heavens thereupon declared that the bet was rightfully won by Balarama alone. Rukmi is surely telling a lie when he says with his tongue alone and not with his heart that he has won. So saying with his tongue alone, meaning that he knows that he lost. Ignoring that voice, Rukmi, 
who was instigated by wicked kings and prompted by his own death, spoke mockingly to Balarama, being keepers of cows roaming in the woods, you do not know the game of dice. Kings play at dice and sport with arrows, not men like you. Insulted thus by Rukmi and ridiculed by kings, Balarama flew into a rage and, lifting up an iron bar, killed Rukmi even in that festive assembly, quickly seizing the ruler of Kalinga, who had laughed at him with open teeth and had now taken to his heels, since Balarama has taken up an iron bar and is beating people to death, um, caught him at the tenth step, Balarama smashed his teeth out. With their arms, thighs, and heads broken and bathed in blood when beaten with the iron bar by Balarama, other kings fled in terror. For fear of estranging the goodwill of either Rukmini or Balarama, the Lord did not make any favorable or adverse comment on his brother-in-law, Rukmi, having been killed. Having comfortably seated Anirudha, along with his newly wedded wife in an excellent chariot, while Rama and the other Dasharhas, who looked upon Sri Krishna Madhusudhana as their asylum, and who had all their objects accomplished, drove from Bhojakata to Dwaraka. Thus ends the 61st discourse entitled, Rukmi killed by Balarama during the wedding of Aniruddha, in the latter half of Book 10 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Samhita. And the discourse before this one, the dialogue with Rukmini, evidently took place after that, since in this they refer to that, that incident. Discourse 62, Aniruddha made captive. The King Parikshit submitted, Aniruddha, a veritable jewel among the Yadus, married Bana's daughter Usha. And in that connection, a great and terrible combat ensued between Sri Krishna and Lord Shankara. May you be pleased to tell me all this in detail, O great yogi. So um, Shuka hasn't mentioned any of that before, but evidently Parikshit just knows about that, having heard about it before. Um, since it, of course, happened either during his own lifetime or at least very shortly before his birth. These are recent events. So he is just asking to hear that story in more detail. Sri Shuka replied, Barna was the eldest of the hundred sons of the high-souled Bali, Mahabali, the king of the Asuras, by whom the entire globe was given away to the Lord who appeared in the, in the form of the divine dwarf. Sprung from his loins, Barna even took delight in devotion to Lord Shiva. He was worthy of honor, liberal-minded, intelligent, true to his word, and of firm resolve. He, in, th in those days, ruled over the beautiful city known by the name of Shonitapura, which literally means city of blood. By the grace of Lord Shiva, the gods, though adorable themselves, behaved towards him as servants. Endowed as he was with a thousand arms, Banasura propitiated Lord Shiva, the delighter of all, by playing upon various musical instruments during Lord Shiva's Tandava dance. The almighty Shankara, the ruler of all created beings, who affords shelter to all and is so fond of his devotees, bade Banasura ask of him a boon of his choice. Banasura sought Lord Shiva's constant presence as a guardian of his city. Touching his lotus feet with his crown shining like the sun, Bana, intoxicated as he was with the pride of his prowess, spoke one day to the Lord of Kailasa, who was standing beside him. I bow to you, the guru and ruler of all the worlds, the celestial tree which grants the desires of men whose longings have not been sated, O supreme deity. A thousand arms given by you by way of a boon to me have only proved a burden to me, for in all the three worlds I do not fell out find a well-matched rival other than you. Eager to fight, I proceeded, O most ancient person, against the elephants guarding the quarters, pounding the mountains with my arms full of itching for a fight, but they too speedily took to their heels in terror. The Lord flew into a rage to hear that, since Banasura is both insulting his boon in a way and also just boasting pridefully, and said to him, when your onsign is broken, your encounter will take place with one equal to me. That will crush your pride, O foolish one. Thus spoken, to, thus spoken to, the fool with the perverted mind withdrew to his palace, full of joy, O king, awaiting the fulfillment of the, augurcy, uh, of the augury of the lord of Kailasa, even though it was expected to deal a crushing blow to his power. Even as a virgin, his daughter, Usha by name, um, her name just means dawn, enjoyed in a dream sexual delight 
with the lovely son of Pradyumna, Aniruddha, who had neither been seen nor heard of by her before. Not finding him there and opening her eyes, she got up in a state of excitement, saying, where are you, my darling, in the midst of her girl companions, and felt greatly abashed. Kumbhanda was the minister of Bana and Chitraleka, his daughter. Full of curiosity, she, a constant companion of Usha, questioned her friend. O oh, princess of charming eyebrows, whom are you looking for and what is the nature of your longing? I do not find till today anyone who has espoused you. Usha replied, in my dream was seen a certain young man of dark brown hue, with long arms and lotus-like eyes, clad in yellow and captivating the heart of women. I am in quest of that darling who, having allowed me to drink the honey of his lips, has gone to some unknown destination, plunging me, though thirsting, into an ocean of misery. Chitraleka said, I shall bring the youth who has stolen your heart, if he is traced by you in the three worlds, and dispel your agony, point him out. Having said so, she drew faithful sketches of gods, Gandharvas, Siddhas, Charanas, Nagas, Daityas, Vidyadharas, Yakshas, and human beings. Among men, she portrayed the Vrishnis, Shura, Vasudeva, Balarama, and Sri Krishna. Perceiving Pradyumna, Usha blushed. Beholding Aniruddha, portrayed with particular care, Usha cast down her face through shyness, O king, and smilingly exclaimed, It's he, it is he. Concluding him to be Sri Krishna's grandson, Chitraleka, who possessed yogic powers, journeyed, O king, through the air to Dvaraka, protected by Sri Krishna himself. Resorting to her yogic powers, she bore away Aniruddha, son of Pradyumna, who was lying asleep there on a beautiful bed, to Shonitapura, and showed her friend the object of her love. With her face lit up with joy to behold the loveliest of the lovely, she enjoyed life with him in her palace which could not be easily peeped into by males. Honored with exquisite raiment, garlands, sandal paste, incense, lights, seats, etc., drinks, foods, and other edibles, as well as with loving words and bodily service, and remaining concealed in the maiden's apartments with his mind captivated by the said Usha, whose love for him was constantly increasing by leaps and bounds, Anirudh had no idea of the number of days that were slipping by. While she was being thus secretly enjoyed by Aniruddha, that hero of the race of Yadu, and felt overjoyed, the eunuchs in charge of the gynasium noticed her through marks that could hardly be concealed as having been deprived of her virginhood. They reported to Bana as follows, O king, we notice the conduct of your virgin daughter to be such as is apt to cast a stain on your family. We are unable to make out how came about the defloration of your daughter who is constantly guarded by us in her house and could not be easily perceived by men. Sore distressed to hear of his daughter's pollution, Bana hastened thence to the maiden's apartments and noticed there Aniruddha, a jewel among the Yadus. Bana Sura was taken aback to behold Aniruddha, sprung from the loins of Pradyumna, who was no other than Kama incarnate, and therefore exceptionally charming in all the three worlds, dark brown of hue, clad in yellow, having lotus-like eyes and long arms, a face lit up with the luster of his earrings and curly locks, as well as with his smiling glances, playing at dice with his darling, who is decked with festal ornaments all over her body, and seated in front of her, and wearing between his arms a wreath of jasmine flowers peculiar to the vernal season, tinged with the saffron painted on her breasts during his bodily contact with her. Perceiving Banasura to have entered the room, surrounded by a detachment of armed soldiers, Anirudha, that scion of Madhu, stood firmly, taking up in his hand a steel bludgeon with intent to make short work of them, like Yama wielding his rod. Like the leader of a pack of boars killing dogs, he made short work of the warriors, even as they rushed on all sides with intent to seize him. Being struck by him, they issued out of the mansion and ran helter-skelter with their heads, thighs, and arms struck. The powerful Banasura, son of Bali, got enraged and bound Anirudha with the cords of serpents with the Nagapasha weapon while he was busy exterminating his army, so the tradition goes. Overwhelmed with grief and despondency to hear of his bondage, Usha loudly wailed with teardrops in her eyes. Thus ends the 62nd discourse entitled Aniruddha Taken Captive in the latter half of book 10 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sanhita. I think we have time for one more. It's not super long and it wraps up this story. 
Discourse 63, Anirudha uh, brought back to Dvaraka. Sri Shuka began again. On this side, the four rainy months slipped by. Um, the relations of Anirudha, who sorely missed him and had been sorrowing for him, Osayan of Bharata, since he had now been gone for four months. Hearing from Narada the whole story as to how he had been taken prisoner, as well as of his doings, how he had disposed of a contingent of Banasura's army before being taken captive, the Vrishnis, who looked upon Sri Krishna as a deity, quite correctly, proceeded to Shonitapura. Accompanied by an army consisting of 12 Akshauhinis and united under the command of Balarama and Sri Krishna, Pradyumna, Satyaki, Gada, Samba, and Sharana, as well as the other jewels among the Yadus, Nanda, Upananda, Bhadra, and others, closely besieged the capital of Bana from every side. Beholding the city with its urban gardens, fortifications, towers, and gates being shattered, Bana, full of rage, sallied forth to meet them with an equally strong army. Surrounded by his followers known by the name of Pramattas, including who are the, um, the elite Bhutaganas of Shiva, who is his protector, um, including his son, Lord Kartikeya, and riding on his bull Nandi, Lord Rudra too fought with Balarama and Sri Krishna uh, for the sake of Bana, since he had given this promise to Bana as his boon to defend his city. A most tumultuous and astounding encounter took place between Sri Krishna and Lord Shankara, an encounter which made one's hair stand on end, and another between Pradyumna and Kartikeya. Another combat similarly raged between Balarama and Kumbhanda and Kupakarna on the other. A similar duel took place between Samba and Bana's son, and another between Bana and Satyaki. Rulers of gods headed by Brahma, ascetics, Siddhas and Charanas, Gandharvas, Apsaras and Yakshas came forth in their aerial cars to witness the conflict, especially the duel between Krishna and Shiva. Sri Krishna, a scion of Shura, put to flight with his sharp pointed arrows discharged from the Sharanga bow, the followers of Lord Shiva, the Bhutas, Pramatas, Guhyakas, Dakinis and Yatudhanas, Vetalas and Vinayakas, Pretas, Matrakas and Pishachas, Kushmandas, and Brahma Rakshasas. Lord Shiva, the wielder of the Pinaka bow, discharged various kinds of missiles at Sri Krishna, the wielder of the Sharanga bow. The latter, however, unconcernedly neutralized them all with counter missiles. Against Brahmastra, he employed Brahmastra. And indeed, it's good that they're very skilled gods doing this because normally a Brahmastra encounter like that would be devastating to the whole world. But evidently, Krishna and Shiva, of course, have the power to portray them, to deploy them with great precision. Against Vaya Vyastra, he employed the Parvata, uh, the Parvatastra. So against the weapon of wind, he employed the mountain weapon. Against the fiery missile, he employed the Parjanyastra, the rain cloud, to extinguish the fire. And against the Pashupatastra, he employed his own Narayanastra. Then, stupefying with Drumhanastra, Lord Shankara, who forthwith began to yawn, casting the yogic sleep upon him. Sri Krishna, a scion of Shura, began to strike down the army of Banasura with his sword, mace, and arrows, while Lord Shankara is temporarily swooning in slumber. Being beaten on all, on all sides by the volleys of arrows discharged by Pradyumna and emitting blood from every limb, Skanda escaped from the battlefield on the back of his peacock. Struck by Balarama's pestle, Kumbhanda and Kupakarna also fell down. With their generals killed, Banasura's troops fled in all directions. Highly indignant to see his army being scattered, Bana rushed towards Sri Krishna on the battlefield in a chariot, leaving Satyaki alone. Drawing 500 bows all at once, Banasura, who ran amok on the battlefield, applied a pair of arrows to each. Lord Sri Krishna split all those bows at once, and striking down the charioteer and the horses, as well as the chariot, blew his conch. Bana's mother, Kotara by name, now stood naked with disheveled hair before Sri Krishna with intent to save her son's life. Making it a point not to look at the nude lady, Sri Krishna, the elder brother of Gada, turned his face aside, which gave Bana a moment to escape. Meanwhile, Bana, who had been deprived of his chariot and had his bows broken, retreated into the city. On the host of Bhutas having been put to flight, the three-headed and three-legged Dvara, the um, demon of fever, 
dispatched by Lord Shiva, rushed towards Sri Krishna, a scion of Dasharha, as if burning the ten directions. Beholding him, Sri Krishna, who was no other than Lord Narayana, sent forth his own Jvara, and both the Jvaras, the fever demon of Lord Shiva, the supreme ruler of the universe, and the fever demon belonging to Lord Vishnu, began to grapple with each other. Beaten with violence, the Jvara commanded by Lord Vishnu, uh, by the Jvara commanded by Lord Vishnu, and terrified not to find asylum anywhere else, the Jvara commanded by Lord Shiva loudly screamed, and seeking shelter with Sri Krishna, the ruler of the senses, glorified him with joined palms. The Jvara said, I salute you, endowed with infinite power, the ruler of the highest gods, the soul of the universe, the one without a second, absolute consciousness, the cause of the appearance, subsistence, and dissolution of the universe, comprising whatever there is, the most tranquil Brahman, who are only inferred by the Vedas. The time spirit, destiny, karma, svabhava, the individual soul, the subtle elements, the body, the vital breath, the ego, the evolutes, the subtle body, and the process of mutual causation going on in a cycle between the linga body and karma, as between a seed and the sprout. All this constitutes your maya. I take refuge in you in whom the said maya finds its negation. Appearing in diverse forms, assumed by way of mere sport, you protect the gods and the pious, uphold the standards of morality that maintain the world order, and kill those who deviate from the path of virtue and live by violence. Your present avatarana is intended to relieve the burden of the earth. I stand scorched by your radiance in the form of this fever, which is most terrible and hard to bear, in which, though mild before, has grown severe. Embodied beings undergo suffering only so long as they remain bound by desire and do not seek the souls of your lotus feet. The glorious one said, I am pleased with you, O three-headed one, let your fear of my Jvara cease. There will be no more fear to you, uh, from you to him who remembers this dialogue of ours. Thus addressed and bowing to Sri Krishna, the infallible Lord, the Jvara under the command of Lord Shiva departed. And so that whole passage in Sanskrit forms a traditional chant um, to four victims of fever. Mounting a chariot in the meanwhile, Banasura returned to the field of battle to contend with Sri Krishna. Highly enraged, that demon who wielded various weapons in his thousand arms showered arrows on Sri Krishna, the wielder of the chakra, a protector of men. While he was thus discharging missiles again and again, the Lord with his chakra, keen edged like a razor, cut off his arms like the boughs of a tree. Even as the arms of Bana were being lopped off, Lord Shiva, the source of the universe, who took compassion on his devotee, approached Sri Krishna, the wielder of the chakra, and submitted to him. Sri Rudra prayed, Indeed, you are the supreme effulgence lying hidden in the Veda and known as the infinite Brahman, that men of purified intellect realize as all pervading like the sky and absolute. The firmament is your navel, fire your mouth, water your generative fluid, the celestial region your head, the quarters your ears, the earth your feet, the moon your mind, the sun your eye, myself your ego, the ocean your belly, and Indra and the other guardians of the spheres your arms. Herbs and plants are the hair on your body, clouds are your flowing locks, and Brahma, the creator, is your intellect. Prajapati is your organ of generation, and Dharma is your heart. Thus you are the supreme person with whom all the spheres are connected. O Lord of undiminished glory, you have taken this form for the vindication of virtue and the, and the advancement of the world. Endowed with power derived from you, we rule the seven regions. You are the one secondless most ancient person beyond the three states self-luminous, the cause and ruler, himself uncaused. Yet, in order to reveal the diversities of the three gunas, you appear through your own maya and divergent forms. Just as the sun gets concealed by its own shadow <coughs> and reveals the clouds as well as all other forms, even so, O perfect one, self-luminous yourself, you get covered, you get as if covered by the ego, and yet make the gunas and all beings which are qualified by the gunas shine in your light. With their minds deluded by your maya, people get attached to children, wife, house, etc., and begin to sink and float in the ocean of misery. He who having obtained the human body granted by you does not control his senses and worship your feet, is no doubt a pitiable creature who is deceiving himself. O Lord, he who neglects you, the beloved self, the supreme ruler for the sake of sense objects, which are just the reverse of you, swallows poison, rejecting nectar. Myself, Brahma, the creator, and the other gods, and all sages of pure mind have taken refuge in you with our whole being. 
because you are our dearest soul and supreme Lord. You are responsible for the appearance, continuance, and dissolution of the universe, alike to everyone, unperturbed, the beloved friend and deity, nay, the very self of all. You are one without a second, the support of the worlds as also of the individual souls. O Lord, we adore you for release from the bondage of transmigration. Lord, this Banasura is a beloved devotee of mine, and is much liked by me. I have assured him of my protection. Therefore, kindly extend your favor to him, even as you did to his great-grandfather Prahlada, the ruler of the Daityas. The glorious Lord replied, O worshipful one, we shall do whatever you have said and that which is pleasing to you. I have fully approved of what you have decided. Banasura is a grandson of Virochana. I cannot kill him inasmuch as a boon has been granted by me to Prahlada that no one born in his line would be killed by me. His arms have been cut off by me only to curb his pride, and his huge arm in his has been exterminated simply because it was a burden on the earth. Four arms are left to him. They will be proof against age or destruction. He will be the foremost among your attendants. Though an Asura, he will henceforward have nothing to fear from any quarter. Obtaining this assurance of security, the said Asura saluted Sri Krishna with his head bent low and duly brought Anirudha back together with his bride Usha, placing them on a chariot. With Bhagavan Shankara's congratulations, Sri Krishna departed, placing in the van Anirudha and his wife, in the van means at the head of an army, who were finely dressed and fully adorned with ornaments and were followed by an army consisting of one Akshahini. Sri Krishna entered his capital, artistically decorated with flags and ornamental arches, with its streets and quadrangles sprinkled with water, and was met by the citizens, his relations, and Brahmanas, who came forth to receive him with the sounding of conches, drums, and kettle drums. Parikshit, he who, rising from his bed in the morning, duly recalls the story of Sri Krishna's combat with Lord Shankara and his victory, will never meet with discomfiture. Thus ends the 63rd discourse entitled Aniruddha brought back to Dvaraka in the latter half of Book 10 of the great and glorious Bhagavata Purana, otherwise known as the Paramahansa Sankita. And I think we can stop there for today. Yeah, thank you guys very much for coming. Thanks, Devla. Awesome. Yeah, glad you could make it, Radhaji. It's been a while. I have a you know, interest uh, question, mm -hmm. Dave. Yeah, sure. Uh, does uh, um, you know? So Krishna had like tens of millions of sons and grandsons. Well, right? he had. Yeah, if you if you go to the grandsons, yes, he had. What would it have been? Sixteen, a hundred and sixty thousand sons. 160,000 sons. Wow. And each, he had, he had 16,108 wives, and each of them had 10 sons. They also I had hate. daughters. There's reference to them also having had daughters. But yeah. um, given the, um, the Kshatriya kingship culture's preoccupation with sons carrying on the lineage, it was the sons who Shuka enumerated to Parikshit. Um, but yeah, so, so he would have had, yeah, um, 160,000. And some sons. Wow. So uh, naive Western, a Western, <clears throat> a naive question from a Westerner. Uh, d is is that a thing in India currently still to this day? Where I don't I don't really know about I don't I don't hear about this. Where like people are like, oh, we're descendants of Krishna. Yes, absolutely, it is. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. the the Yadava clan is still oh. alive and well in India. There's millions huh. of them, and they are very proud of it. Uh huh. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, um, 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 Devala, I thought yeah. the Yadva clan was destroyed. It largely oh. was, yeah, and we'll read about that in the Bhagavatam. Um, so whoa. why are you saying why are you saying then that um we are descended of them? Uh, there are many many people in India today who claim descent from the Yadavas. Um, no, the, the literature. It's, it's disputable uh, whether they whether they are correct in their claim of descent. But exactly. It, so, 
but yeah, here, because... here's, the th here's the thing. The Yadava clan at Dvaraka was destroyed, but this doesn't get into, um, again, it's, it's, a, it's a paternal versus maternal line thing. The paternal line was destroyed, but this doesn't Whoa. get into all the daughters of the Yadavas who married off into other clans, many of whom were oh. the daughters of Krishna and Rukmini and so on. Not all of them were destroyed. They married off into other families. And so it's very reasonable that the blood of Krishna, the bloodlines of Krishna survived all over India and people claim descent from it. The Yadava clan at Dvaraka gets wiped out as we'll read in the Bhagavatam. But well, I don't know. It is literally written something different. So we have to, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah, but like they, they're, not, they're not claiming descent through the paternal line. They uh, claim descent through the maternal lines. Okay. Mm. Through the daughters of Krishna who were not wow. destroyed. Because uh, Parikshit was one of the descendants, right? Parikshit was a descendant um, from the Pandava line, from the line of Kuru. Mm. Um, so they were cousins if you go back far enough, but he wasn't a descendant from Krishna. Although Krishna yeah, so did I think... play a part in his birth because he, uh, Krishna entered into the womb of Parikshit's mother Uttara um, mm. to save Parikshit from the Brahmastra um, when he was in the womb. Yeah. Wow. So basically, the Yadava clan was destroyed. So, I mean, they, I mean, it's, it's literally written like that. So, yes, yes, I don't know. We'll see later. Yeah, yeah. It goes into the destruction. And of also the about, the, about the women thing that he had so many um, wives. I just wanted yeah. to refer to that that um, when he came as Ram, so many ladies wanted to have him as, yes. uh, you know, so that was the desire thing that needed to be fulfilled so it was and people look always like a mundane eye but it's not like that at least to me mm -hmm. so just wanted to say that yeah i mean we read it said in in just today's discourse and also another um discourses it repeatedly says that all of his wives were partial avatars of lakshmi wow. um all sixteen thousand one hundred eighty and eight of them that Lakshmi incarnated in all of them for the purpose of having this um, marriage with him and his avatar. And also, yeah, it did mention that um, just the other week we talked about how um, some of these were women who had sought the blessing of marrying him in the form of Rama. And while in that incarnation, he was um, purely monogamous and wanted no, no wife other than Sita, he promised a bunch of these souls as boons that he would return and marry them in another form and fulfill and this as Krishna. Yeah. And also the one guy that captured all these ladies and um, yeah. Shri Krishna uh, freed them. You know, yes. in those times, people didn't want to marry people that were captured like that. So um, to restore their honor, Sri Hari married them. So that's why that was the logical explanation towards certain things mm -hmm. yeah and they also all wanted to we and that, yeah was, that was just in today's discourse that all of them upon seeing him yeah but in the, mundane, him uh, in the mundane way it's not oh it's marriage just like uh, you know people think a lot of other things but it was mainly a spiritual happening yeah yeah it was, it was largely a divine Leela. All of them were forms of Lakshmi. Uh, now, there were 16,000 in this one instance, correct? <clears throat> yeah, 16,100 to be exact. Right, and, but that's not all his wives. It's almost all. Right. There were eight okay. others. Oh, really? So yeah. this one instance of 16,100 was where he got this whole huge community of wives Yes, there were there were eight others. The the eight others are called the Ashtabharya, and right. then the sixteen thousand one hundred that he rescued from Narakasura, and that's all of them. Really? Oh, okay. He yeah. So that this was like a one that there were the eight Maha wives, and then yeah. like this one sixteen thousand one hundred instance. Yeah, and, and that's it. He didn't it, and he didn't keep going like that. No, no, like, no, no, no <laughs> further wives after that. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. If I may, mm -hmm. when and how, to your understanding, did such cultural standards start 
decrescendoing, if you know what I mean, into monogamy that we have today. You know, like, was well, there, is there even a scriptural in, reference? Even in, Krishna's, even in Krishna's time, monogamy was the norm for the vast majority oh, of people. Really? Um, multiple wives <laughs> was mostly practiced by um, Kshatriya rulers. And oh, it was yeah. because it was incredibly politically advantageous. Um, it, oh. it prevented wars. Like um, oh, wow. marriages were the way that Kshatriya families made peace treaties with each other, essentially. Right. Um, and like, like the, the different kingdoms of India were bound together mostly by ties of marriage. And you hear all the time that like it, like it determines who fights for the Pandavas versus who fights for the Kauravas largely who is bound to each other by marriage, they're not supposed to fight each other. And so it like, if there's a powerful king, it's very politically important. It, it, it's not so much for the sake of the like marriage in the modern Western context of being about the romantic love of the husband and wife. It, that uh -huh. was not the main concern. Um, right. it, it was, it was, um, it was political. Like sealing political alliances. And so oh that was God. why it was very practical it was, for Kshatriya It was kings. more for keeping peace on earth also. Yeah. It's yeah, not yeah, yeah. only political, just more about peace. And also there was a uh, spiritual uh, foundation to it. Like with the Western mind, with the modern, I shouldn't say Western, with the modern mind, um, we cannot think uh, what it could be. So a lot of people say, oh, Krishna has so many wives. Why can I not? So, okay, <laughs> if can you give them honor? Can you give them respect all together at yeah. once? So, yeah, go ahead, do that then. You know? <laughs> yeah. and, and of course, Krishna had what, what's the, what was the word they use today uh, where he, uh, oh, he takes on uh, semblances, was the word I liked that they use. How, like, you know, most husbands, most men couldn't take on 16,000 semblances simultaneously. Yeah, and be with them all at once. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah. hey gotta gotta give it to him if, if you can pull that off sure guys yeah you can have multiple <laughs> yes. lovers. let's see let's see you do that <laughs> andy he was Sri hari man he was not just a mundane man <laughs> yeah oh. exactly yeah, yeah oh shoot amazing yeah thanks Tabla. yeah thank you guys thank, thank you guys, you guys. yeah well Hi, what, things, what, what do we got we got like we had uh oh full moon full moon is happening as we speak it's at like 10 30 or something like that or i'm sorry not full moon not, i'm sorry no no equinox the equinox the yes, spring the equinox. equinox yes it forgive is me now. full moon just happened and now the equinox is happening like as we speak in like 10 minutes yeah oh what is that well the, um, you know I guess it's a western it's a western reference isn't it well let's say it's 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 fatic too it's astrological it's, it's the um equal the night of the equal length of the day and night the exact midpoint oh, between okay, the yeah, yeah. yeah what does how does geodish recognize uh, that's been one of my uh you know things where people are like oh western has no value and i'm like well the western respects equinox and solstice yeah sure the, did, the, the, did, vedic, the, the vedic British? calendar tends to be less focused on it because it's lunar rather yeah. than solar and the equinox is a solar date um right. but no it, it is definitely recognized there's um oh like spring festivals for it and, and such in the, in the Vedic tradition as well. But when nice. moon is in Falgon, the, the year actually kind of ending and then Holi um, is uh, played, by the way, Shub Holi to you all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shub, Shub Holi. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so then they burn all the you yeah. know, negativity, but the burning of negativity also happens when you meditate and transcend every day, twice a day. Yeah. And then the next day, um, after burning the fire, you merge with colors. Like, you know, you forgive people. You don't keep bitterness in your heart and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you right. come together, you celebrate. I heard a lot of tradition has this burning of fire. Oh, yeah. Yeah, all over the world. Yeah. Beautiful. Great. Yeah. Great. Shukhali, have, have a Shukhali. nice day. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Haribo. Haribo.